especially in the present, that, uh, there's a dismissal, especially in social science, cultural studies, there's a certain kind of dismissal of the body. Like, okay, uh, uh, there are echoes of Foucault, and there's echoes of a bunch of, of, of different people, but can we, can we really understand the term ethnicity, for example? Can we understand nationalism? Can we understand class theory? And at the same time, have the racial body present? And uh, much of our work has been devoted since the beginning to uh, a critical, not dismissal, but revision of concepts of ethnicity-based concepts of race, um, class-based concepts of race focused on inequality, and nation-based concepts of race focused on um, peoplehood, on some imputed collectivity, without uh, really looking at the role of the body in that process. And what is ocular, what is optical about race, something that we really need to pay attention to. Can we understand racial profiling without reworking, reintegrating, rethinking the role of the racial body? Um, uh, and as, as I say, there is a link to Foucault here, but um, there's an also a really important uh, connection between the micro and macro dynamics of race. Uh, uh, to um, uh, think about ways in which, in our own selves, John, we are living out large social structures, and, the, and this is definitely embodied. Without uh, the 
at times explicit, but now ever more explicit recognition that there are deep links between uh, race, class, and gender, most specifically, but other, form, uh, other forms of identity as well. Um, without that recognition, we would be in a much more um, uh, well dominated place, much more oppressed place than we are today. And it's also important to recognize that we make this argument steadily throughout the book, and especially in the conclusion, that um, it is through the politicization of the social, through the rise of identity politics, through the recognition that the experiential dimension of our lives is indeed a political dimension. The phrase of personal is political, of course, is associated with the second wave feminism. But in many, many ways, it predates second wave feminism and flows from the rise of the black movement after World War II, the years following World War II. We, we are trying to argue, and this will be important in a moment when I talk about uh, neoliberalism, we're trying to argue that it is through this politicization of the social that uh, not only that the tremendous challenges would, could be mounted to the uh, Jim Crow system and the old system of, of white supremacy, but also through uh, it's through that politicization of the social that an effort has been made to re-articulate racial politics in terms of cold blindness. And this has led to the kinds of threats we've been experiencing uh, since about 19, 1970. Threats from the right, re-articulation from the right, a right-wing politics of identity, a right-wing politicization of the social. This concept of rearticulation requires a little bit of explanation. Um, the whole, uh, this whole idea that political struggle takes place, especially around race, but I, I would also want to argue in other contexts around other issues, for example, um, uh, abortion rights would be a really good example. The, re the right to life, the way that re rearticulation happens in other ways, well, um, is uh, an appropriation of insurgent politics and a reframing of those politics in more reactionary or conservative ways. So it's that dynamic when we talk about instability in terms of, uh, of racial politics, uh, it's that dynamic of the taking of a particular position and reframing it in such a way as to absorb and incorporate and co-opt many of the, uh, much of the energy of that insurgency and also to control the, the, the dangerous, radical, unstable element, destabilizing elements. It's that dynamic that is uh, central to the articulation. Um, and right, let's note that rearticulation goes in both directions. It's not just, uh, well, we can be colorblind now and fulfill Dr. Wilson's <coughs> true dream about the content of our history, the children's character, and so on and so forth. That's not just that kind of reactionary rearticulation, but also we as movement people, as radicals, have rearticulated um, previous existing political formula, previously existing political formulations as well. And uh, um, uh, in this slide, you can see uh, Danielle Allen's new book. Danielle Allen is, uh, I think, a, uh, a national treasure uh, politically, theoretically, intellectually. Um, I really recommend this book. Um, it's basically a rereading of the Declaration of Independence as a radical document. A, um, uh, it's, it's an effort to demonstrate how we can re-articulate, we ourselves can re-articulate many of the uh, more progressive elements of uh, what had been a, 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 a racially impressive uh, interpretation of the law. I'll move, again, move beyond that, but I really recommend that. 
this way we should come to, in, in light of the rearticulation, in light of the politicization of the social, we should come to understand colorblindness, which is the current hegemonic racial ideology in the United States, as more than simply backlash. Remember that colorblindness used to be our thing. And it makes sense that at a moment, in the final years of Jim Crow, when, when Dr. King was delivering that speech, when uh, the famous, I have the speech and so on, when um, desegregation appeared to be a, uh, a, a itself a radical uh, reframing of, of racial inequality and racial injustice in the United States, an overthrow of that, that colorblindness looks itself a radical. And, um, you know, colorblindness remains, we're arguing that colorblindness remains a uh, contested, unstable, contradictory concept. It's not only uh, a, a, a tissue of contradictions, deceptions, lies, uh, you know, avoidances, it is that. But at the same time, it's not only, in fact, a complete impossibility, but at the same time, um, it, it indicates deep contradiction in the current racial regime. We are at a moment of tremendously explosive contradictions in racial politics. On the one hand, the state claims colorblindness. On the other hand, the state needs race to rule. How, do they, how is that handled? How does that, how does that work? In virtually every aspect of state activity, in terms of policing, repressive activity, in terms of electoral life, in terms of cutbacks in the welfare state, in terms of uh, social regulation, social investment, uh, in terms of foreign policy, Race remains a central element, a central uh, uh, component of, of the uh, American imperial regime and the American domestic regime. Um, in that sense, the current hegemonic framework of colorblindness underlies neoliberalism in the United States. We need to think about neoliberalism as much as a uh, as as much a racial project as a class project. Neoliberalism's key objectives were not only economic, they were not only redistribution or uh, control of the welfare state that they were also the political necessities that such objectives required. In other words, to, to, um, to limit the welfare state, to limit the redistribution, the extension, the long-delayed extension of social democracy, of the, of the, the principles first laid out by the, uh, in the New Deal, and then only grudgingly ex extended to people of color um, in the 1960s, when finally the New Deal, of course, was uh, a highly racist framework, which, uh, uh, which systematically excluded black people and brown people from the welfare state. And then in the 1960s, under the Great Society, under the pressure of the black movement and its allies, it was expanding. That's what civil rights reforms were about, to include people of color. And it's that expansion, that threat of a really, a deeply uh, entrenched state <coughs> that provoked the racial reaction that we now know as neoliberalism. In order to do that, in order to make that racial reaction work, and also I would have to say, as a gender reaction to it there, 
um, again, the right to life, et cetera. Um, it, it was necessary to argue that the objectives of the civil rights movement <coughs> have, in fact, been achieved. And that's where colorblindness comes from. Um, <coughs> Inconceivable in the United States to, be, to uh, argue for a, uh, a to enact a colorblind, I'm sorry, uh, a neoliberal, neoliberal economic program without a very substantial dimension of colorblindness. moment about Obama, almost at the end of that time. How do we see him? Do we see him as a, a mere token, a shill of Wall Street? I've had that argument with many, numerous, numerous uh, radical friends of mine. Or is he, in some sense, a transcendent figure? The one, Neil. Is <laughs> <laughs> it either one of those? Then we're in the realm of normal politics. And uh, it's important to recognize the continuities between Obama's politics and the current Democratic uh, Party positions and the, those of his predecessors. Neoliberalism has not only been a right-wing, post-Reagan, in some ways post-Nixon uh, program. United States or a project. It's also been a central center left project, particularly visible in the Clinton administration and now in the Obama administration. Um, this has uh, this center left neoliberalism is what a lot of us movement people are reckon, uh, are wrestling with today. And, and it's, it's notable, again, the state needs race to rule. And, uh, Obama's contradictions on this are particularly strong. Uh, he has been a strong advocate of colorblindness. He speaks of race when he has to and avoids it every chance he gets. <laughs> so, it, it, and at the same time, at the same time, <laughs> Obama has implemented numerous, uh, numerous repressive racial policies. He's not protected blacks against the greatest cumulative loss of wealth in the 20th century. After 2008, black median household wealth <coughs> went from being about uh, one eighth of white to being 120. And it's not try to think beyond just this, that statistic to the actual meaning of that in terms of experience. Again, the politicization of the social in this regard. Because what that meant was that there was a widespread expropriation of, black, of, of the meager resources blacks had accumulated. And particularly through foreclosure, which of course wipes out what little down payment you have, what little equity you have. By the way, for Latinos, although the, 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 this jump and this uh, disparity around wealth was not quite as great, it, it was still, uh, I think that, I don't have the figures here, but I think it got us to about a, a one, a 1 to 16 as opposed to. 1 to 20 ratio, 1 uh, uh, one sixteenth as opposed to 1 twentieth of the median uh, household wealth. Some other things that Obama had not done. So, some concluding notes. The politicization of the social has reshaped U.S. policies. This is a, um, a development directly attributable to the rise of 
uh, the black movement in the in the, the, the years after World War II. And by the way, this has global dimensions, which I'm not going to talk about today. But similar processes can be discerned in Europe, in uh, Latin America, and elsewhere in the world. There was one tower thing. Holborn, that is. And that was re-articulated re on the right as a politics of resentment, sometimes called colorblind racism. Where does, that, where does that leave us today? What, what really strikes Michael on me in giving talks and working on these issues and talking to white-minded people about race and, race, race and racism today is how uncertain we are, many of us are, about our own beliefs, our own ideas, our own race consciousness. When, they, when you are asked this question, I'm not sure we have a chance to, to discuss this further because I want to get it out from behind this podium, but ask yourself the question, what do you, what, what do you want your race, race consciousness to be? How conscious do you want to be about race? And if, if you are conscious, at what points are you, do, you, do you want to suspend some of that consciousness? Many of us have, you know, live in, or have interracial identities. Many of us have lived, you know, are in interracial relationships. Uh, but, you know, if, if we think of race as something that we experience every day, we realize that at some points it's very central for us, at other points it isn't. The instability of race, the contested character of race, pervades our personal lives as well as our large-scale social life. Politically, we want to be able to arrive across racial lines. Politically, we want to be able to live with love and actually live in ourselves with multiple meanings, contested meanings of race. How do we handle that? Second question, what do you see as a social, social justice oriented state racial policy? What should the state be doing about race as opposed to what it's doing now? These are the questions that we uh, attempt to answer, attempt to take on, in the particularly in the final chapter of our book. Thank you very much. Constructing 
and other racing someone um, or you know racing a large scale social pro practice or social structure like when the Supreme Court does it um, uh, is it cannot happen uh, in, you know, in just one direction though it, it, we're also con constructing ourselves I mean there's a there's a um, a whole, a huge sociological, psych, social psychological literature on that, on how the self it's, it is itself a social structure. That's what uh, uh, John Powell was starting with there. So, um, what, we're, what we're really talking about is um, a set of relationships between people, micro level, experiential, small scale, and macro level. Uh, also experiential, but large scale, in which um, power is being contested, in which the, the ability to define oneself, democracy, the ability to create uh, uh, a society that, that we, we want to live in, or the ability to resist a, uh, uh, an op oppressive uh, police state are, are being worked on. I mean, this is almost self-evident, I think, and it's just, a, it's really important for us to recognize that and, um, and go, you know, go deeper into it. And, you know, it, I'm always telling this to my students, when you encounter dilemmas in try, trying to understand race, just go deeper. Just think about how it's lived. You know? And then in that process, uh, this, uh, this, uh, self-society relation that you're talking about, uh, we can see as constantly being made and remade. And that's basically what racial formation is. Um, no, I mean, just to add to that, you know, one of the kinds of fascinating things uh, we sort of gesture towards, but really don't get into very deeply, is to um, look at some of the insights that are emerging from the mind sciences particularly with, uh, you know, John Powell has really sort of um, uh, talked a lot about implicit bias, for example, the kinds of attitudes and mental schemas that affect our understandings, our actions, our decisions in a kind of unconscious way. And in many respects, what's very interesting is, is, is to think about the ways in which um, at that unconscious level that, in fact, certain kinds of representations get embedded, certain ways in which we other different groups, in which we marginalize other groups. But also, it seems like there hasn't been a real sustained discussion between some of that kind of literature within the kind of uh, the implicit bias in mind science literature with the kind of more um, uh, arguments about the institutional, uh, institutionalization of practices that allocate resources and, Different set. So, in other words, what I what we think is an interesting way is uh, what would a kind of productive and more engaged relationship to look at the various ways in which um, those processes happen as being extremely important that we sort of ignored or erred in one direction or the other in trying to think about the mutually constitutive processes by which um, we live race. We live race on an everyday life. Uh, yeah, uh, Howard, you, know, you just, well, the impression I got was you're presenting identity politics as this uh, basis for a democratic challenge to the state and, and capital, but what I see is uh, a challenge for sure coming from the right wing, and that's based on identity politics. <coughs> I mean, in other words, I don't see identity politics as some kind of panacea or... Uh, Necessarily progressive. What? Yes. Necessary. Right. Yeah. Well, can you, do you deal with that in your new edition? Well, he asked you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 I mentioned that very briefly, but I, you know, I would definitely agree with what you're saying, David. I mean, they, uh, the, the, the rise of identity politics uh, really involved uh, an effort to democratize American society in, really in, in very simple ways. And um, <coughs> you know, this is extremely notable if you, if you look at the, the history of the civil rights movement, if you look at the history of 
um, allied movements, you look at you know, brown power, red power, yellow power, to use the color categories, you, you see this, this, this much deeper examination of who we are and how we got, got to be in this place and how we live our lives as Native American people, as Tejanos, uh, as whoever we are. Okay. And you know, I think this is very, really strong. You know, there's a huge literature now, too, documenting, historical literature, doc documenting the um, uh, rise of you know, modern feminism, second wave feminism, as a, uh, uh, a consequence of the experience of women working in civil rights and allied movements. Okay. So that's all a, a sort of radical view of identity politics. But at the same time as that emerged, uh, it set up numerous rearticulations, numerous ways in which, hey, you guys have your identity, and identity. Well, I have mine too. I'm here in the suburbs. You know, I'm here. I'm a. I'm a religious. I'm, I'm a deeply religious person. Um, my church is telling me this. It's telling me. Um, that abortion is a sin. It's telling me that they, you know, it might even be telling me that the curse of Ham is still operating, you know? I, uh, it, uh, you know, it's telling me that homosexuality is, you know, it, it, is, is a sin and so on. So, you know, these, uh, the, uh, these, po these politics uh, emerged as very strong movements too. I mean, I think particularly um, uh, white politics emerged in, as, as, as reactionary identity politics. And, I mean, we, we have just so many <coughs> examples of that. Um, you know, all quite carefully constructed, but again, going deep as well. Uh, you know, reverse discrimination. Well, well, I don't agree with racism either, but you know, black people can be just as racist as white people, that kind of stuff. Um, it, it, colorblindness is perhaps the consummation of that. In a sense, you know, that, we, you know, we have students who tell us, I have students who say, I don't see color, a person's just a person to me. I deal with everyone as an individual, everyone on their merits. And, uh, you know, it's actually rather difficult to argue against that, or at least, you know, for, for everyday people in everyday life. It sounds so democratic, it sounds so inclusive. Yeah, that's the strength of the rearticulation we're talking about. And it's also possible to deconstruct that. And, you know, I think that, you know, our, our work is a lot about that. And, you know, I think the work of most of the people, other people in this room are also, is also about that. Like dealing with those contradictions, dealing with those uh, dissemblances, dealing with the, the, uh, this whole uh, you know, willful uh, ignorance that is also involved, or self you know, uh, aggrandizement that's involved. And, well, you know, I'm living here in the suburbs. I don't have to worry about uh, um, racial profiling. I don't have to worry about you know, being uh, 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 Subject to a whole range of other repressive measures, but you know, I don't have to, I don't, I don't really think that this race stuff really applies so much anymore. You know, so by the way, if, if just a real one, two, <laughs> quick one last thing: if 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 colorblindness was once our thing, and then it became their thing, is that the end of the story, or is a further rearticulation possible? Do you, how many, how many rearticulations do you get? <laughs> I, mean, I think it's really, it would be, it's really interesting to think about how we as radical Democrats, as people on the left, as people who believe in uh, equal di distribution of resources and, and uh, true application of principles of justice in the courts or on the street by police or whatever you want to talk about, um, you know, how do we reframe this Colorblind this thing. I don't think it's just something to be denounced, although it is definitely deserving to be denounced. It's also something that can be rethought in a way uh, in terms of 
having more freedom to, to, uh, to recognize the realities of one's racial identity, you know, and the complexities and the contradictions of, of one's racial identity, you know, so that you can, t at, at certain points, your raciality is really central, and at other points, it may not be so. I mean, that's actually how we live anyway. How can that be recognized politically, institutionally, socially, culturally? for us that led to countless discussions between Howie and I was this notion about race as a sort of master category of template and to uh, at the same time acknowledge and really deeply realize uh, so the sort of interpenetration of what uh, how racial meanings are constructed through sexuality, through gender, through uh, various other kinds of axes of stratification and difference. And I think um, it, it sort of is, um, what we were trying to suggest is at least looking at these things sort of historically as they unfolded, to look at, for example, how class relations in the United States were very much uh, set up since the period of our nation-based slavery and how different articulations of that occurred. Um, but um, it's, it's in saying that, it's often that you have to think about a particular issue, a moment, and being able to sort of deep, deep, deeply look at what, in fact, um, what, what the kinds of ways in which the complex expression of these things, as they, as they, as they result in things, um, from you know the abortion rights movement to, well, getting back to David's question about think about the Tea Party and the Tea Party as. A